Welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. Casper, it's a pleasure to have you back on the show. You survived the holidays and you're wearing a jumpsuit. Pleasure to be. Yeah, I did. Uh, the holidays were when I grew this beard in uh, March, uh, I did not anticipate what was going to happen this time of year, because for some reason, I don't know what it is, my haircut, my glasses, I keep being mistaken <laughs> Or this other mythical figure when I'm out in public, which means I have to I have to be careful when I'm swearing. I have to be careful. I was on the train the other day and I look up and there's this little little boy sitting beside his mom and he's right across from me. And he's just his eyes are really big and he's tugging on his mom's coat and pointing. And I'm like, so I I kind of had to do that. And he was like, <laughs> but I was what? like, don't, what's the nose thing? But yeah. Santa does this magic thing. It's sort of like, that's where it's, haven't you ever watched Bewitched, man? All the magic's in the nose. <laughs> that's that's why cocaine is so magic. I know. I was about to say, was you, were you trying to hint to the kid if he was good that year? You'd be giving him a, that's that's cool though. I mean, if I was you, I'd play with it. I'd go around and, you know. I did. I, you got to be careful because sometimes you get the ones who, they start asking him for presents and stuff and you're like, Okay, this let me. I'll just. I'll go. Well, if you're good and you do the things, because you could. You could look over at mom. Mom's going. <laughs> but you know, you have to be that. But it's it's good. Yeah, you do kind of play with it. I sometimes uh, because over here you'll have little kids will go to like you go to the pub rather than a bar, and there will be families in the pub with you, kind of thing. So they look over and they see Santa having a pint, and you kind of just have to go. You know, just hey, it's all good, kind of thing. But other than that, it's it's pretty good. It's there's I there's much worse mythical figures you could be uh, mistaken for in a way. But the next time I go get my beard trimmed, I'm gonna say to the barber, I prefer to look like Zeus rather than Santa, please. <laughs> and as long as they get it, that's cool. I'm like, you know, just shave, do something, you know, give me a lightning bolt. I don't, I don't care what it is, but yeah. I get the occasional Spider-Man kind of toss out, but of course you would, yeah. It. Well, not not Miles Morales, but the other guy. That'd be weird if it was Miles Morales. I'm like, what's wrong? What's wrong with you? It's like my son's colorblind and walks away. It's like oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> not that kind of colorblind. That's we've already opened up cans of worms. Welcome to the podcast. We do this every show. <laughs> Are you afraid of cancel culture? As uh, you've talked about it a few times in the past, I'm episodes, but... not actually. I well, see, I'm in a I'm in a really weird job. I've actually got, I haven't been canceled, but I've been, um, I don't know, if forbidden is the right words. Uh, in the in the past, like I'm, a, I come from the acting background. I used to do like you know X, X Files, Outer Limits, all you know, Smallville, that stuff, and. Back in the day when you were an actor, you you did stuff where they might ask you to be from Albania. They might ask you to be this. Can you be Spanish? Can you be this? You know, the amount of Indian, like Asian women that I know who played Mexicans for a lot of shows on the West Coast was insane, you know, because they just had darker skin. So they played Mexicans. And then... Lately, over the last year, a breakdown will come down and it'll say, looking for somebody from this. And I go, well, I can do that. you know. And they're like, well, no, we'll get into a lot of trouble if the client finds out you're not actually from there. And so I would say, well, what happens if you can't find someone from there that to do it? And this is the whole where we're getting into lots of uh, um, where they're saying things like if it's a disabled person, only disabled people can play that role on television now. Well, what happens if you can't find a disabled actor who can fit that role? Uh, and this is the whole thing there. Now, me, because it's just my voice, I've lost a couple of things where they went, yeah, you could probably do the accent, but uh, either I'm not famous enough, you know, like the uh, Hollywood A-listers who will do different accents and things. But even that's getting into a bit of, uh, you won't have like the Daniel day Lewis's or the Brad Pitt's or anything pretending to be someone else because the backlash that's coming out, which is why um, I think film and TV is getting kind of boring <laughs> in a way because they're... Uh, I wouldn't say it's boring. It's just they haven't found any new concepts that are really, really yeah, good. Yeah, there's... There is... Uh, I think what it is is there... Nobody's really... Uh, it's like they've dropped the creativity pencil underneath the table and where they're... 
So they're just rehashing old stuff, which is kind of boring in a way. Like the, and when we were having this discussion, act Christmas day, we we're having a discussion about um, like all the, the Disney stuff that's failing these days because they're taking characters that are well known and well loved and making them diverse. And it was just pointed out by somebody who's not even in the business. They said, why don't they go with make up their own or do their own thing? Because when you're taking a character who's well known, like the little mermaid, for example. Um, and I said, yeah, I mean, when Hans Christian Anderson was writing these stories, he's writing from where he was living and what he was doing, you know, and all there was, um, there was no people of diversity around where he was living when he was writing. And Disney actually, they changed the crap out of that story anyway, because at the end of the little mermaid, she dies and goes to heaven. Um, and that's considered to be the best thing that could happen to her because her soul goes to heaven, which in Hans Christian Andersen's or his time, that was the best thing that could happen to you. You die, you go to heaven. Uh, his best story he wrote, or one of his best stories, they don't, uh, they don't really do it, but it's about an actor who he's really young, really good looking. He delivers the best performance of his life. His first show, he get he gets a standing ovation. He has a heart attack and he dies and he goes to heaven. And the critics after the show are like, this young man had the best night of his life because he had the best show he's ever going to have. And then he went to heaven. So his life fulfilled everything he needed to do, but he was like 21. So everybody else who's watching that, like in us is a, you know, Western culture. We're looking at this going, how, how is that the best thing that could have happened to him, man? What are you talking about? And, but when the story was written, so when we're looking at these stories now, of course, when they, you know, like Snow White and we, you know, the stories, but like the Brothers Grimm, there's a reason why we, the word Grimm, that's where it comes from. These guys wrote, those stories are bloody and they are nasty and they are scary and they are old folklore tales. But when, like when you get Snow White and Sleeping Beauty and all that stuff, they were like nasty stories. And Disney got a hold of them and went, well, we could do something with it, which is okay. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing with sort of taking the story and changing it a little bit. But uh, they called it, you know, Disneyfying the story. But now you're getting something where they're really changing stuff like that. So I, I haven't really had too much of that yet. I've had a couple clients say, no, we'd much rather, we're going to see if we can find someone else who's closer. The, the worst thing that happened to me was... Uh, a client approached me and said he was looking for a Canadian to do this thing. And I went, well, I, I can do that. That's, I mean, that's, that's, you know, I'm, that's where I was from. I'm, I'm living in the UK now. And so we did the spot and he actually got back to me and he said, yeah, thanks a lot for, um, you know, submitting for this. We went with an, an actual Canadian. Uh, <laughs> and I went, what is an actual Canadian? He met somebody who like still lives there. But because I've moved away, I'm no longer an actual Canadian. And that was when, when that brush hit me in the head, I went, fuck was that? You couldn't think an actual Canadian. And I went, I don't get that at all. I don't get that. And so, so it, the entertainment industry is getting kind of wonky that way, but uh, do you think as it's far the as industry the, that's doing the wonky stuff, or do you think it's the fact that maybe the industry has influenced society to start kind of pushing more towards looking like, cause if you, and it's kind of like a devil's bargain. Now I'm a pro support. Like if there's a documentary about a dude who's trapped in a rock thing for 146 hours, instead of getting James Franco for just having James Franco's face, why don't you use the guy who actually did that and had that horrible experience happen to him? But if you saw how people got mad about that, about why couldn't you have someone with who's missing an arm do the role? Why did you have to have James Franco do it? Well, the guy who the movie is produced about his life, he wanted James Franco to play him in the movie. And then everyone just goes, oh, OK, that's fine then and walks away. And I'm like, wait, wait, wait. So we were just outraged a minute ago and now we're not outraged anymore because you realize that someone closer to you. This is what they depicted. This is what they envisioned. This is what they experienced. 
But it brings the bigger question. I mean, do you want studios changing their profile pictures to rainbow flags and doing stuff like that, knowing full damn well they're only doing it because they want your money? They don't actually care about those things. That's, like yeah, that's really, that's true. I mean, you've got a, the, what's happening now is I think things are sort of swinging too much the other way. Um, and they're getting, the backlash that's coming from, uh, like you have to be really, I don't think Disney realized that, it, you know, they, they kind of took star Wars and, and people make fun of it, you know, the, you know, the, the prequels and then the, you know, the, the last three movies and they're saying, well, they were, they're junk, you know, they weren't written by, you know, George Lucas sold rights to the thing and they changed them kind of thing. And then you have, you know, some of the other stories that are happening, like it, I think it started with Peter Pan and then they did, uh, they did the little mermaid and then they did, uh, Mulan and they changed them. They changed the things. And there were some people who went, well, wait a second, I grew up with that. And that's not what I remember. Um, and how you changed it, you didn't make it any better. You just made it different. So I think they were, you were right. They were, they were going for, they were trying for a better market value. Maybe they could attract more people. And I think what they did was they swung a bit too much. It's sort of like when you're going for left field and you swing the, they keep hitting the foul balls and so because you're pulling your swing too much and, and. Well, why, why so did they, they make another film that we've seen multiple times? There's been multiple versions of Fantastic Four. There's been multiple versions of, I mean, first of all, Captain America, Chris Evans was the human torch originally. So I cannot unsee him as Captain America. I can only see him as the human torch. That's, so, that's really true. I mean, he, you're, um, a lot of people forget about that, but you're right because you're a true, like you, you caught him once doing that the first time you saw him as he was already a superhero and then he becomes a different one. And you kind of go, how does that, how did, how did they Well, work that the one greatest out? thing that Marvel could do was enter the multiverse. And I know a lot of people don't like it because they're like, well, then nothing's, there's no one timeline you can get attached to. And I was like, well, that's kind of the point is that Captain America can now be any ethnicity you want him to be. Captain America can be anything. That's so important for the culture, for the society out there. But also, if you're talking about the original timeline, the original characters, I don't need to see another Captain America movie that's remade about the whole first one with just a different actor like Idris Elba or something. I want to see something that is consistent and goes all the way through a couple of movies, and then it's over. I don't want to see it pulled out of the – like Terminator stopped finally. Thank God. You can only pull Arnold off so many times before he has to – they only let you out of that Kennedy compound a couple of times, man. They only let you, <laughs> I'm telling you, man. <laughs> and yeah, and he's, you know, he's, I was, they were thinking, I think when they, I don't know if they were going to do it like another, I think they've stopped the Terminator ones. I, they think somebody, there was another Thank God predator was in it. the works. And I was oh like, my oh my God, man. another one of those. Well, what are these? It, it's I don't like, even know which ones I've seen and which ones I haven't. They're like Rocky movies now where you're like, you know, where I'm, I know they used to, I'm, I'm, do you remember the, I think there was, a, I can't even remember if it was South Park, South Park or um, uh, Saturday Night Live that was joking about like Rocky six, you know, when. Oh, he hits him and he turns into dust. Uh, yeah. And didn't they do like a Rocky six kind of thing? You know, it was, well, it's, it's like sort of... Creed now, which I think it's, it's an interesting story, but you can only watch these movies. You can't really boil them down any deeper than what it is like there hasn't been really anything really creative or something really really good that it just came out recently was the holdovers with paul giamatti it's more of a drama but it's like for me it was just like i haven't seen that guy act in a very long time he used to be in so many movies then he kind of like blipped out of the culture brick brick bring rick moranis back that's what matters that's exactly bring him his back. kid's got to be 18 now he can leave yeah, the kid now yeah because he, yeah, yeah, he, he got out of uh that's why he got out of acting to for a family kind of thing he i think the last movie he did was ghostbusters 2 i think we just got to be careful because there are some movies out there that end up creating something based on fictional or based on real events and then somehow it becomes part of the public's consciousness to where that's how they remember like a, a really dumb example is like Abraham Lincoln. The movie that came out, Lincoln, came out, and at the same time, it was Lincoln Vampire Hunter. I want to know how many people went and saw Lincoln Vampire Hunter, and then next thing you know, you got all these guys walking around or whoever going, yeah, he used to beat up and kill vampires. I've seen it with my eyes. I'm like, geez. That's right, yeah, and he was a superhero, and you're like, what is that term? I'm sure it's the- uh, well, John it's the Wilkes man... Booth was Dracula. I'm like, Yeah, geez. there was, uh, it's the, 
Mand Mandela effect or something like that, yeah. where there's a pretend history. Well, not a, it's a made up history, but people have, they believe it to the point. I thought I was actually suffering that for a while when I was drafted to the NHL because, um, because of the way that uh, the powers that be at the time around me were reacting to that situation. Um, because what I, I don't know if you know how the draft works or at least how it worked in the, uh, in the eighties was what would happen was um, when you got drafted, you weren't told your parents were told your coach was told and the, you know, probably the team that, that, that were interested in you, they were told, but you as a player were never told. So I found out about the draft. I wasn't told by my parents that I was drafted. I wasn't told by my, co well, actually I was told by my coach because he was the only person who gave me a red flag. He said, don't, don't cast, you don't, don't hire this guy. Don't draft him because he's a troublemaker. And what had happened was my coach, um, was what a piece of shit. Well, he, my coach pulled myself, uh, you know, on, on hockey teams, there's a captain and two assistants. And so he pulled us, we were, you know, voted by the team. So he pulled us, we're 15 years old. He pulls us into his office kind of thing. And he says, this is what I need you to do. He goes, um, I don't want any drinking on my team. I don't want any after hours stuff. I don't want no parties. I want none of that. So if you catch any other teammates doing that, you need to come to me and tell me. And all three of us went, no, <laughs> it's, this is, this is a small town in, in the middle of Canada. Uh, and you you can't do that. I mean, you, this is not, um, you don't have that type of power and we're not, not everybody wants to go to the NHL. Not everybody wants to do that thing. So you can't take away. Uh, there are people who are doing this for fun and, um, we're not, we just basically said, we're not going to be your, your squealers. We're not going to tattle. And because of that, we, uh, we got on his naughty list. And so he would, uh, uh, as a result, he stopped a lot of us from, from sort of getting like certain awards that they would hand out and things like that, you know? Uh, and, uh, I found out from him because he told me flat out, he said, yeah, I told them that you were a troublemaker. So you're not going to, that's what I don't like about like that whole coaching thing. That blind side effect is real where everyone's trying to find one of those stars, like kids that's like seven feet taller than any other normal kid in their grade. You're going to take me to the big leagues. You're my professional payoff. That's the thing. And so when, now this is the eighties, I think it's, it's kind of changed. I imagine a little bit, uh, but there's, there's still that aspect of parents living their lives through their children, or you've got that one coach who says, I'm going to be the, I'm going to ride this guy. And when he makes it, I'm going to make sure everybody knows that I'm the one who, who got him through, you know, wasn't his Michael Jackson's dad. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it was that type of thing. So the, uh, so when you get into that type of aspect of where you've, um, uh, where you're being pushed through and you don't find out and you do all this stuff, um, I can't remember why we started talking about this, but that was, uh, the, um, so when you get into the cultures of what's happening now, as, as we're talking about the, the cancel things and things, there are people out there who can say, um, no to you and you don't know that you're being sort of you need to find out who's uh who's sort of in charge um and who's uh who's doing the talking about you kind of thing before you get into the room so to speak it's that it's that type of thing so you uh i think it, for mainly in my job i just have to be a professional i just have to go in and do my thing uh when it was when i was acting it was slightly different there was a bit more shenanigans going on uh with uh but but this was also back in the day where budgets were put aside for coke and hookers. <laughs> so, you know, there was certain some of the best where... creative ideas come from. <laughs> exactly. Well, and, and then you see some of the movies and you go, yeah, they wrote that one after that part of the budget kind of went in. And it's just, uh, there was, there was some of that stuff, um, you know, not getting into the, the Harvey Weinstein stuff or anything like that, but there was some kind of crazy, 
Uh, oh, 100%. You can't be that famous, man. There's no way. You cannot have that much power and it not end up going bad. It happens. It just with too many people. And like, so yeah, and so, you'll, so you'll get into that kind of thing, stuff where you get over here. Now, here, I don't know. I haven't heard anybody say um, uh, this person can't do that part because they aren't that. Uh, they're not from there. It happens a little bit. Um, the UK is a bit different because the here, I think we've had this conversation before in America. One of the, in, if you get questions, you're asking a question in America, it's usually, um, uh, what do you do? Uh, is usually one of the first three questions you get asked, what do you do? Whereas over here, it's where are you from? Uh, because they need to put here in the UK, they need to kind of put you in a box. Are you from the North? Are you from the South? Uh, because there, there's a different mindset between the, the British people here, as far as, uh, London is considered very, you know, where the, the, you know, more posh, more up North was where they had the miners and the, um, sort of the tradesmen and the, so if, if you're from the North. There are people here who will still treat you differently. There's there's very much a class structure here in the UK, which I had to kind of get used to. It's still it's not as prevalent as it used to be, but there is is still kind of there. Um, but you don't really get that in North America. The class structure kind of get comes from money, like how much money you make here. Whereas you've got there, you could have people here who are like lords and ladies and dukes and earls, and they're piss poor broke but they own a crap ton of land or they might own a big house in the country that they can't afford to keep kind of thing because it's been passed down from age to age and it's a it's a really strange it's a really strange thing but uh did you uh this is slightly off topic did you catch the doctor who specials that were on or is do is... i've never seen that show at all i don't have time to watch tv as much as I might bitch about the entertainment industry, yeah, I, really I suppose, don't have time yeah, because you're, it. yeah, with all the stuff that you do, and that the, see, I don't even know what's what's popular these days in, uh, on on the two. My TV hasn't been on for a while, although I'll do some streaming. I'll do. I've been getting into a to topic I've been trying to look in more into, which was old westerns and how they would like develop through time. But every time I try and find someone to talk about it, it's all about like how westerns were racist. And I'm just like, look, nobody's saying that what you know John Sean Connery or Clint Eastwood did on screen was good or anything, but Westerns have influenced society. We still like a lot of our culture has been about certain monolithic things. And a lot of it happens to do with spy thrillers, action movies, James Bond. Everyone knows the references and knows the names because they just they're everywhere. I mean, not maybe not so. Uh, James Bond's everywhere. Yeah, there's been multiple James Bond, but stuff like that with aliens and big and westerns. And... Westerns are very much a part of American culture, aren't they? Kind of thing. They there's a uh, the interesting thing is um, back when you could shoot somebody in the street. Well, yeah. Just see, at you I'm the. Uh, I wonder I, if it was I, really like that. I believe that. Well, that's the th see. That's the thing. Like I, I do a lot of narrating for the this. Uh, society called the the Royal National Institute for the Blind People. So I do a lot of like, the I become like people? their go. Well, I narrate books for blind people, and the uh, I damn. Become, so you're like the Morgan Freeman of the blind people. Well, kind of, yeah. But I become like their go-to Western guy. Uh, and the first book I read for them was like a Louis L'Amour old school Western, you know, written in the you know early 20th century kind of thing, and the um. But the last one I read just recently, uh, I remember I'm reading it and I remember saying to the guy, we we're having this conversation, exactly what you're talking about, where if you want to do a Western these days, you got to be careful because of uh, how is like, how is the author going to treat the, what you see in Canada, I would say First Nations. I don't know what the Native Americans are called nowadays or, or if they're just called Native Americans, but you have to be careful how you're going to deal with them in the book. Because, you know, in old school Westerns, cowboys and Indians, like when you played cowboys and Indians as a kid, um, the Indians are always the bad guy. <laughs> they, were never, they were never the good guys. Um, and, but then it wasn't until later where you found out where actually the, even the, uh, you know, the, the army, well, they weren't the good guys either kind of thing. And then you had the settlers coming out and they, some of the settlers weren't good guys. And then this particular book was, um, was actually quite interesting. Uh, it was more of like a, a 
it was more of a revenge tale about um they did a really good job of uh introducing the the native americans into this group of settlers who were coming around but it was all um it was a it was taken it took place during the um civil war so that was a whole other aspect as well because you had uh groups of people who would form little posses and they'd become like a basically like a, a hell's angels group and they would pretend that they were going around collecting supplies for the army whether it was the north or the south but they were actually just stealing stuff for themselves and they would they called themselves the the i think the um there was the home squad there was the home guard the home guard was one and it was so basically it's a bunch of outlaws who just would get around pretending to be good guys but you know this is post the internet post or pre-internet pre all this stuff so how do you know like how do, so they used to come to a farm and they would say we need to we need you to donate stuff for our cause you know so we can bring it to the for the army and if the farmer said no they would just kill them and burn the farm and loot the place and by the time you caught up with them the the farm is burned down this is you know Pre DNA, pre so you have to first see it, now you got to find out who's doing it, and that's what the story was about. It was about this guy, his family. He 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 got shot in the war, so they sent him home, and he gets home two days after his farm's been torched and his parents are dead, and so now he's got to find out who did this, and that's what the story was about. But a lot of the westerns that you read are very you got to like the whole idea of like the cowboy hat. Uh, that was, uh, most people who were like cowboys, they wore, do you know, the, they either wore top hats or they wore the, we would call them derbies, the bowler hat. Yeah. Bowler hat. That's, that's what most people were wearing back then. The, the cowboy hat came around during the fifties, like with the shows like Rawhide and all this that were Clint Eastwood's first shows where they were first introducing these things hats themselves didn't really they were just big chunks of felt that you kind of pulled over your head and they were mainly used to uh hold water and feed for your horse so they they didn't really have like the the john wayne you know the the texan hats kind of thing weren't really a thing yet and uh there was a the west was pretty uh it was pretty crazy that when you read yeah but that's like every time period though it's just it's big Things like people bring up Native Americans and cowboys. I think you just have to really look at it from a human aspect, which is like from if you they made a movie, which I think they should from the Indians perspective or the Native Americans perspective. They're trying to kill and fight these cowboys that are coming in out of nowhere and they're scared. So then if you look from the cowboy perspective, then it's just all these crazy Native Americans scalping people and, you know, their friends. So it's like it's just how the world works. It's like when someone randomly gives you the middle finger while you're driving in traffic. You immediately think, what the hell has this guy got a problem with me? And then you get mad at that person when really they could just be having a bad day and it's hard to have that hindsight, but it's just, and I think you've cut them off. Yeah. And well, the, the other thing is, and this is another thing that, um, when we were, it was, it was really interesting doing this book because the, as we're reading it, um, there's, of course, there's some, uh, love interests in the book, um, always. and the always, because it's a cowboy book. Got to get aroused somewhat while you're reading the, the book. But she's either going to be the school teacher, yeah, or she is the divorced, oh yeah, uh, woman who's now running the tab the local hotel, Miss Catherine. So exactly, and so there's no other, and every other woman is married, kind of thing. And this story as well had the whole. Um, this one woman shows up um, because she's been sent a letter from our hero's brother who... Um, what what fucking book are you talking about? You never even said the book. Well, I can't even remember. The, the, it's called The Trail of Redemption is what the name of the okay. book is called. I'm sitting here like, what, the, what book is no, he it's, it's called the trail. It, yeah, it's called The Trail of Redemption. And in this story, his brother has been communicating with this girl who lives in Pittsburgh, I think, or something like that. Okay. So she... and. He basically says in this letter, would you like to marry me? And she says, yes, I'll come out. So she hops up. <laughs> wagon. Wait, he said it through a letter? That's how they did it back then. You didn't. In yeah. fact, most of the time, a lot of 
when they talk about mail order brides, big deal. That was a big, huge thing. And you had settlers who would come out and then send letters back to agencies um, in the bigger towns like Pittsburgh and New York and things who <laughs> like scalping tickets, but with women kind of, of that's terrible. Wait, could they do mail order men for, yeah, well, I don't know if you, I would sign up for that program real quick. Yeah. You know, there's <laughs> someone out there listening like Robbie, that's human trafficking. I'm like, Oh, I didn't know. Which is kind of what it was. Cause you, you, so you didn't, you never met your husband when you were coming out. You just kind of came out. So basically she arrives and the the brother is already dead because he was on the farm that got killed and so she meets our hero and our hero is he's more of a goody two shoes kind of guy uh so he's not gonna he doesn't actually have feelings for his brother's wife and it was so there was it was quite it was quite an interesting uh book that way but it's they have westerns have changed a little bit i don't know if, the very first western i think i ever read was shane did you ever read that when you were in school Shane was pretty much the the old uh, cliche of uh, you don't really know who Shane is. He kind of shows up at this, he becomes like a farm, they're like ranch hand kind of thing. You got to stop explaining books to me. You're making me fall fucking asleep, man. Well, no, but he's a, they catch, he catches up with his past and he's got to go out and kill some people. Do some movies. I know plenty of Western movies. Magnificent Eight or Seven. Well, Magnificent Seven, the which is based on the Kurosawa stuff. A, a lot of people say Star Wars is the Magnificent Seven in a way. Like it, and it's that whole concept of the local people get together. You need to gather together a group of heroes who are going to help yeah. you. And bullets never hit them. Never, not once until the end. Bullets, bullets never hit him until the end, and at the end, it's uh, they usually step in front of a bullet. <laughs> it's what ends up happening in those. But they have a. You want to see a good western? See Unforgiven. Okay. Uh, it's a when it's Clint Eastwood directed and wrote it, um, and Gene Hackman's in it. Great, great flipping movie. But Clint Eastwood wanted to show what it was actually like or what he feels it would have been like back then. Like there was no such thing as quick draw. Like the the showdowns in the middle of the street would sometimes take two to three minutes, sometimes kind of thing. When you think about it, like the, the ones we see now are over, but what was actually happening is six guns were rem remarkably inaccurate. And so you'd have guys, they would take their gun, they'd pull it out, they would sight, and they would hang and eight times out of 10, they're going to miss. So they take another shot. Um, and you know, they might get winged in the shoulder, so they're not down yet kind of thing. So there was none of this, you know, immediately getting shot and falling down. And, and, uh, they were, and when you got hit, it was like boom, and chunks of you were being blown off because there's big honking and the bullets because of the gunpowder, they didn't travel the same velocity. So you basically had sort of like this kind of fast, but a slower moving hunk of metal that was just going to go on and you just got hit by it. And so there was a lot of, um, well, what do you think about movies that would be representing historical depictions, Would you prefer they be a hundred percent accurate with no fantasy included, or do you like it when they lure you in with uh, some fantasy? That's, that, that's a good one because what happens if the actual, how it's depicted is boring, <laughs> you know, like I, even in unforgiven, um, I know that what, like when you watch it, I, like I'm not, I won't give away that, but when you're watching the, say some of the fight scenes and how slow and pedantic they are, he's making a point um, and because everyone who's used to watching Westerns is going, hurry up, you know, man, hurry up, hurry up. You're going to get shot. You're going to get shot. And, and so he's, you know, slowly loading his gun, getting everything done, make sure it's all good. And, and we're so used to watching quick draw like uh tombstone and all this kind of things where you had the you know the Wyatt Earps and all that things where there was a I I think I prefer sort of a mix I guess it would be because if they were going to be historically accurate how many times have you heard somebody say yeah I'd love to live back in the time of like the knights I think that would be so cool no it wouldn't they didn't have soap <laughs> They didn't have this. There was no such thing as a shower. Everybody stunk. You know, they, you know, there were diseases that would, uh, that we've taken care of a long time ago. 
There was no comfort. There was no houses were cold. There was no central heating. You didn't have hot water. So there's a lot of people when they go, oh, it would be romantic. No, <laughs> I don't think it would be. So I think if they showed a lot of stuff, what it was actually like, um, people might go, I don't really like that kind of thing. Or I, I wouldn't want to be there. Would you want to be there? Because part of the reason why sometimes when you're watching a movie is you want to sort of be drawn into what they're doing and you you know, you want to see if you can put yourself into their shoes. But some of those is like, no, you get a, the occasional movie where though, I think Gladiator did a good job of that. Um, there is, uh, you know, some of the, uh, the, you know, the full metal jackets and the things where they really show what, fighting yeah, is like some of those didn't do a good depiction of it because they, they got lone survivor as much as it's like a horrible movie it's more about a sense of patriotism and it really just had people signing up at their local recruitment station which is yeah and you kind of go so what was the point of this movie was it what story were they trying to tell and uh that one is uh that's well, it a... makes you question people's careers what about elvis I mean, Elvis was involved in music, was involved in movies, was involved in everything. But, you know, he took a time off from his music to start producing movies that I haven't even seen a single one. But apparently a lot of people know him from that. I mean, his fan base is a conglomeration of like karate fans compared to music fans compared to movie fans. Which is, which is really funny because watching Elvis do karate was quite... Uh... Uh, what was Elvis doing karate? You know, you just kind of, it was all big and over the top. And, and uh, well, the, Elvis took a break for a while because he joined the army as well. Um, now he was probably, um, he probably saw no, see, I don't know because I wasn't there, but as far as I know, he saw no frontline, whatever kind of thing. When Elvis joined the army, he basically traveled from, he, he became like an NCO kind of thing or a USO where he was entertaining the troops. So even though he was in the army, now there's other actors and things who join the army and they actually like Robert Mitchum's, I think John Wayne did as well. Um, the big, you know, who were actually fighting in the war, you know, they got really gritty and then they came back dissolution. I think, um, I think, uh, Clark Gable, I think he did as well, kind of thing. So there were some actors who went. There are some. There was also some actors who were exempt from going. They said, "No, you can't go to war because we need you back home to film propaganda." Yeah. <laughs> and and which made perfect sense at the time, where you, because but you had a lot of actors who were like, "No, I want to go fight for my country." And they're like, "You're working for your country. You're going to be selling war bonds. You're going to be doing all that stuff." And so you kind of went, "Okay, I get it." I get it. So that's, so it's, um, yeah. And back it's... to the question I said that you never answered talking about, uh, the multi multifactorial things that a person's celebrity can possibly be, whether it's music, movies, any of these. I mean, that's, it's, it's weird how you can get a whole collection of a fan base based on like, let's examine Clint Eastwood compared to Elvis. What's Clint Eastwood known for? Well, he, he did movies. Well, did you know Clint Eastwood was also a bit of an artist? You know, like, does anybody like him? Does anybody ever come up to an act? Billy Bob Thornton's a good example. Will not talk about his movie career. Only wants to talk about his music career. If you mention in movies to him, he'll tell you to fuck off. Oh, see, I didn't, I didn't know. Like, well, you know, like Sly Stallone, art, he's a painter, um, uh, who's sold some stuff as far as I know, kind of thing. And and Muhammad Ali was uh, also a painter. Um, yeah, but they're not known for that, though. No, that's the thing. I mean, they now. How come nobody wants to ask me about my paintings? Well, Mike Tyson, it's not what you're known for. You, you know, we want to we want to talk to you about knocking somebody out. Like that's the hard part. I mean, like, what do you do? Like, um, Elvis. Now, of course, like Elvis was known for his singing kind of thing, but he did movies. He did this other stuff. He did. Um, he's he was also a. Um, what else did he he had some uh I, d I don't know any of the ones he directed but it's kind of tough when you have like say you're already famous and you're known for something and then people find out later on that you have a hobby that you're actually pretty good at um so what do you do in that situation like um it's not there are some people who started after they started acting or musicians or doing whatever there's not a lot of um you don't really see a lot of crossover 
people like Elvis anymore, do you? Kind of thing. Like the, no, the I ones think he who was are a one time celebrity for the times, but I think now you really got to put all your effort into one basket. You can't do what Elvis did. Yeah. You kind of had like, you had Mandy Moore who was kind of doing singing and movies for a while. And then she did some voiceover stuff. You had, uh, um, you had the sting for a while, tried the singing and acting stuff. You have some, you'll have some singers or actors who will kind of do both, but they really, you'll see them sort of falling back into their, no, I think I'm just going to stick with my, what my main thing is kind of thing. Uh, because there's almost a fear of if you spread yourself out, there's, uh, you'll get lost in a lot of that. So you don't really see the multi entertainers like, uh, it's really weird. Like in Japan, if you're an entertainer, you are pretty much expected to do it all. Like if somebody says, Hey, we need you to host a show. Uh, you're like, hey, okay, that's fine. But you know that you're going to be also asked to sing, to dance, to tell some jokes, uh, to, um, you know, maybe tell a story, do something like that. Uh, when you're an entertainer, you're an entertainer. So when you uh, become a celebrity there, you're very much a multifaceted where celebrities in the, the, you know, the Western hemisphere, you're, you're pretty much known for your one thing. Like there's certain actors you kind of go, well, I would never ask that person to, to host something because I, you know, why would I? Well, I just don't think you can do the multifactorial thing. I think everything is constantly, there's always something new every day, like a million times a day. You're, there's so much out there now that if you're not putting all your eggs in one basket, if you try to do a music career, if you try to do a movie career, if you try to do this, it's just going to be damn near impossible to ever get remembered. I mean, look at The Rock. He does so much work when it comes to movies, yet he's not trending all the time. He trends sometimes if he has two movies that get released around the same time. But most of the time, he's doing a lot of things, but you don't really hear about it because of the fact that there is anywhere you look up on your phone, there's constant other trending news, other articles, other things like that. I actually have a little bit of a theory is that whenever I'm on Facebook and you come across these Facebook reels that they have like videos and stuff like that, they're always of movies that are just now on Netflix. Which, yeah, which the, that'll say something because they're trying to get to, you know, the promote do or do whatever they, it's, um, you, you brought up something really interesting when you're talking about the trending, um, what's another trend that's happening in my, uh, I don't really see it so much in voiceover work yet. Um, other like, you know, I, I won't get into AI or anything like that, but the, where something, the it's very much what you're doing, the podcasting. Um, influencers are starting to be cast in movies because they have a shit ton of followers. Oh, I know that. I know that. Well, it started with Vine stars when they were doing those well, short clips. Yeah. And then they did that. Well, there was Vine, but then, you know, you have a movie like, um, is it free, free guy? I think where yeah. they, there's six um, streamers they brought in. Now they wanted actual streamers to, you know, so they've got grabbed some pretty big names who are, you know, big um, Ninja and all those other ones. Ninja, Jacksepticeye, you know, that kind of thing. And, they, and so they grabbed them. And those guys, though, now are actually, they're being asked to do movies. They want them in movies and TV shows. Oh, God. Mainly because people will watch them simply because they have followers. Uh, they had a great story on Suits, the show Suits, uh, where there's a 16-year-old influencer who uh, is being done for, she was promoting a product that does is actually harmful to people. It's got chemicals in it that were burning their face or something. And, and as they do, as they do, as they do. So she, so she's meeting with this, with the lawyer kind of thing. And it's a very interesting scene where they talk about, she says, you've probably seen it, you can find it, where she says, um, I don't have to do anything. I don't have to, you know, in fact, you're going to actually pay me money. Um, and the, the lawyer's like, what are you talking about? And she goes, I have over 16 million followers. They'll do anything I tell them to. So I can just tell them not to use this clump, this company's product and they won't. And this company will lose all their money kind of thing. So if you want this settled, you'll pay me money 
and I won't diss the product. Jesus, that's a horror film if I've ever heard one. And so, yeah, and so the lawyer is like, actually, I think you know exactly what you're doing. I don't care how old you are or what you know. You know, she was 16 or something, and so she's not quite of age yet, or however that. Um, but that very much horror film, like where you're getting to. So we are one step away from influencers going. Well, no, I think I'm going to call the shots on this one because I got a lot of followers and there's nothing you can do about it if I tell them. Now, where this gets into a bit of trouble is you, when you're following, you'll have, um, there's a couple things that you're not supposed to do um, uh, <laughs> as an influencer. Do you remember that you've heard the term swatting where an influencer will basically call SWAT team and say, hey, there's a terrorist in this house and they know it's a particular streamer. And so online, usually while they're streaming live, a SWAT team will break in kind of thing with, you know, the big guns kind of thing. And that was a big thing um, around the 2010s that was happening quite a bit where it was how you got back at your, if somebody pissed you off or done something, you swatted them. And now there's something called doxing which is basically documenting um, you go to another streamer's house and you photograph the house and you show online this is this person's house this is where they live just saying and if you have 16 million followers hmm. say You're chances fucked. are well chances are one or two of them are a bit nutty oh 100 percent. yeah so Raise that up to like eight out of 10. Well, exactly. So when you dox- Watching a Minecraft video for 24 hours, trying to tell me you're normal. Well, exactly. You And so when you dox somebody, you might think, well, what's the big deal? Huge deal. Because now you've got crazy people who know where you live. Uh, now, online, you'll see people posting stuff like, well, what's the big deal? This is, it's public knowledge. Well, no, it's not public knowledge. It is kind of if you- uh, you might, like phone books used to have our addresses and stuff in it back in the day kind of thing. And you could probably track down somebody's address if the, uh, if they wanted to kind of thing, but there are some people who, you know, maybe haven't posted. So now because of this information age, you post somebody's address online <laughs> and that's like, so that's a no, no, uh, in the, the streaming world. You're not supposed to do stuff like that. That's, you're not supposed to flex your guns that way kind of thing. That's, it's pretty crazy because that influencer line is like right there with the cult line. Like you have literally, you could literally just put up a video saying how we're going to raid this guy's house and they'll have a bunch of people out there with pitchforks and torches ready to, with their little Minecraft helmets on, ready to fucking exactly. kill Exactly. Isn't that the thing? And then when, you know, when the, and then even then you could have, and even though the, the streamer could go like online and go, what are you guys doing? You know, like when, you know, like say like, 500 people show up and they're out in front of this guy's house and somebody's streaming, Hey, look, we're at this guy's house. Where are you? And the streamer's like, I didn't tell you to go there. I didn't tell you to do any of this oh, stuff. Oh, it's an AI created version of them. Did yeah. It? It's like, what are you guys doing? You know, kind of thing. Or you must, well, not even an AI version. It's like, you guys must have misrepresent or miss what I said. I just said, this is where the guy lives. I didn't yeah, tell you. you. Well, you told us go out there with pitchforks and torches. And and she go and then they'll go, or she or he will go. I was kidding. I can't believe you guys took me seriously. And that's so that's kind of happened. And so there's, I'm not a, I'm not really into that world. Like I don't, I don't do TikTok. Uh, <laughs> I don't. I just can't figure it out. You know, they just. I and I have a feeling that if I if I got a TikTok account, I just spend too much time watching like stupid cat videos or something. I don't know what to do. There's not that many on TikTok. And you would know. So the no, the I don't know this, but TikTok gets a bit crazy. Like and like, um, it's actually a very interesting thing where they would, uh, it's a trending, um, and going back sort of originally to what you were kind of talking about. Now, even though you don't watch it much, I was talking to my friends about Doctor Who and about all the the different doctors and the, and the recent incarnation they have is very much a woke culture Doctor Who. They've really changed the doctor to the point where people aren't happy. Um, 
they're like, why would you do that? I can't believe you've ruined everything. But we were talking to, or the person I was talking to is a, quite a big Doctor Who fan, and, and she was going, well, all the Doctors, since they've sort of restarted things up in the late 90s or whatever, the, when they started this, have been, they deal with what's going on in society right then. So each of the Doctors has pretty much reflected if there was a war going on or if there's a this going on or if, or where there corruption in politics going on, each of the doctors has had stories about that. And this new doctor has come along when the woke culture is, this is what everybody's talking about. So of, of course you're going to have a, a woke doctor. And I went, Oh, okay. Like it made sense when she said it, I went, it's the, you know, how it's kind of trending now, whether or not you agree with it, but, and then, so I guess there's a lot of, and you know, when we started talking about movies and TV, how uh, are movies and TVs now reflecting what's going on or uh, are they creating new stuff? Are they pushing new stuff? And that's where, that's where you need to see where we're missing the point. I think with a lot of movies and TVs, there's, there isn't, as you said, there isn't a lot of new stuff coming out, is there? It's rehashing of old stuff. So we're, it's not like we're moving forward. There's always that one movie that comes out of that one film or that one TV show where everybody goes, holy fuck, did you watch that? Like, you know, like Twin Peaks when that came out or, or even X-Files when that came out, people were Or like, the Barbie oh. movie that people got yeah. so upset about. They did kind of thing. They got upset, you know, and. <sighs> they tried to make it whatever woke a little bit. They made the guys look like assholes and. Made yeah, it. they did. But it's also yeah. a Barbie movie. What do you expect? Well, yeah, because Ken is uh, the... <laughs> Ken's a psychopath. Most guys are a psychopath. I think everyone's a psychopath. It's just about getting to that line. Well, because, uh, you, well, you know, that's how... I want to see OJ movie. I want to see an OJ movie played by, like, uh, who is the Marvel guy that just got, who was Kane the whole time, and they just, what's his name? Oh yeah, I can't I can't remember right because he was just in the it, they just showed his uh yeah, he's uh, got himself in a bit of trouble. But play play him OJ. Make let's make another OJ movie and let's make it more like fun. <laughs> or they only talk about naked gun. <laughs> I would like to see a movie about his life after the murders. Uh Yeah, I guess cuz you don't really I don't like, know how someone can post on Twitter as much as he does and never check his comments because his comments are just littered with people commenting knife emojis. Or like he'll make a video on Twitter and he'll go, hello, Twitter world. That's how he starts off his thing. He goes, it's it's your boy, OJ. And then he'll say, you know, uh, Aaron Rodgers couldn't throw a football to save his life. And he'll say something stupid like that. And then in the comments, it'll say, hey, OJ, I heard you like to shave off the competition. They'll put a knife emoji. And then I'll be like, I heard you're really stabbing into the story here. And they'll just do a bunch of stuff like that that are all, he never checks it. And then there's one person that's in his comments that's like, hey, OJ, hope you're doing well. Martha and the kids send their love. And then it's like a bunch of people commenting like knife emojis, head being chopped off or, hey, did you do it, OJ? Just stuff like that. I'm like, how does he not check his comments? I would be like, good God. Either either he does, either he checks them, you know, and gets off on them kind of thing. Because he knows, exactly. maybe he counts, like he goes, let's see how many knife it? emojis. Well, I don't know. I've never looked into the case because I said I wouldn't until after I spoke with him about Naked Gun. I'd talk to OJ. I'm sure I'd get a lot of shit for it. But for me, I think we're going to miss a whole chunk of history if we don't In talk about ways, Naked Gun. why... See, A, you got a good point. Why do you get the shit for just talking to people? Um, you know, you always because, do. It doesn't matter. Yeah, well, exactly. And that's... that's um, you make a very interesting point. It's like, you always do. Well, why? Like, why are you so upset that I'm just talking to this person? They're like, you shouldn't be giving that person the time of day. What are you talking? And I'm like, well... Why? You know, uh, maybe they've got, you know, it's like, well, we don't need to hear their side of the things. We don't need to hear their story. We don't need to hear the truth. And they're like, oops. <laughs> like where, the, where if there was one kind of thing, the, because I'm sure things didn't go down that the way that they, of course, that the, you know, the way that everything was filmed and, and, and all Social that. media is just Scientology. It's all it is. It's all brainwashing and programming and putting people in the tribes. I actually came across this person who was defending Scientology 
and like really trying to talk about it, I was like, yeah, but it's a lot more than just like people b not believing in psychiatry and having these kind of weird ideas of how the soul and the body and the mind works. They're like, they do some maniacal, like horrible shit, like mob shit. Yeah, they do. Um, well, you, you, I think you've had people on the show, haven't you? I, I know, I know two people in particular who got, uh, were visited by the go squad, what they call them. And mm. it was, uh, yeah, one lady, um, yeah, she, uh, is it okay to punch somebody then if somebody's stalking you and like slashing your tires and shit, is it okay to just knock out a Scientologist? Exactly. You can think, you know, and that's that type of, and when they talk about Scientology, the, the odd thing is, you know, there's the Book of Mormon. I, I don't know if you've ever seen the the show, The Book of Mormon. Robbie, if you haven't, you got it. You should, I don't, it doesn't sound like something that would entertain me. It is one of the funniest things you will ever, ever see. Kind of thing. Well, it's written by the guys from South Park. And so, oh, shit. So, if these are the guys who um, can have the Pandaverse, hmm. which was also one of the funniest things I've ever seen. What is it, Jacqueline Kennedy? She's like, put a put a chick in it, make her gay. Yeah, yeah, Kathleen Kennedy. That is, that is kind of Kathy Kennedy, Kathy Kennedy, please stop, please stop, please stop. And you know, the town hall town has a meeting. Please stop putting, you know, you're ruining everything. No, put a fucking diverse gay chick in there, make it fucking more lame. And it's like, yeah, and Bob Iger from Disney and my my stocks, they're funny. I don't know how they got away with that. You don't want to get on Disney's shit list. I can tell you that much. That's the thing is it's not um disney shit list is now sort of splattered everywhere kind of thing so yeah, that's the, the problem is the problem if you're if you're throwing shit if you stand too close to the wall it sprays back on you so what's and ended up happening with disney is a lot of the, like they're buying up a lot of properties like they own marvel they own star wars they own uh uh well they own all the you know their all the movies and stuff but they, didn't they just by somebody else kind of thing the but they what's in what's happening because of all the woke stuff and because of all the shit people aren't really worried about pissing disney off anymore because they're doing a, a pretty good job of their own of wrecking stuff so because it seems like everything they're touching these days is is not doing very well like look at rebel moon rebel moon just died oh my god um that was getting really hyped you know aquaman all this all this new stuff that's coming out it's all being just dying it's um and so disney even though the there was a time where you didn't piss off disney but now it's like who cares <laughs> and because they've got more they've got other stuff to worry about so this is actually a pretty good time to make fun of them because they're they've got other problems kind of thing now the guys from south park that's a good those guys there was did you ever see the episode with Mr. Hand where he invents the bicycle that can actually get more, it gets, it travels faster and gets more mileage than a jet. And he's busted by the FBI because he, he's becoming a threat to the aviation industry. Did you ever see that one? No, but it sounds legit. The cycle he builds is a, it's, it's a ring. It's a cock ring uh, that is powered by dildos. Uh, you sit on a dildo and you have to suck on a dildo. Uh, and Jesus the power Christ. and the power that's ex and this is on the show. And because of this, he because so you power it this way, and it gets better mileage and travels faster than the average jet plane and so the fbi makes him take it off the market because he's going to he's a he's now become a threat to the federal aviation industry <laughs> the FAA. <laughs> and it's sort of the way that the you know tucker was you know where they where the but it was very well written very well done but so ridiculously stupid that you would go ha well, you know, he's a threat to the FAA, but just how they did it. And you're like, I cannot believe they did this. How does that, uh, how does that? Uh... So yeah, those guys, they kind of just, I don't think they, it's almost like this. Do you remember how the Simpsons used to do that? Not really on the same level, but the Simpsons would not, 
there were certain punches they wouldn't pull. Like when they were, they're already making fun of like the the nuclear industry, you know, nuclear, um, where, you know, and Springfield. And so they'd make a lot of jokes. And there was a lot of in jokes and there was a lot of stuff going on where they, we were like, oh, I can't, they snuck that in there. Ooh, they snuck that in there. And then I think the Simpsons were sort of the first ones who got hit by the, the woke patrol where, you know, Hank Azaria is asked not to do the character of Abu anymore because he's not Asian. He's not East Indian. So that was the first thing that happened um, on the sort of in the the culture where Hank's like, "What well, I've been doing this character for such a long time. They're like, well, no, you can't do that character because you're not, you're not that race. And he's like, well, no, yeah. I'm an actor i'm acting i'm pretending kind of thing and they went no you can't do that anymore it's... yeah i believe in making opportunities for people that would be more culturally established for their roles but i'm not about taking away someone's current career or livelihood to be able to do that you know what i mean that's just to me it's wrong and that's and that's the thing now if you can find somebody to do it and that and so where you get into the when you're talking like the you're talking the cancel culture strangely enough cancel culture seems to be it emigrates or it seems to emanate from the U S from white folk who have nothing. Like when they talk about cultural appropriation, if you've ever seen the comments about somebody who's teaching someone to say like to make a curry and they will go, well, you're not Indian. You can't, you can't cook a curry. And you're like, what are you talking about? I'm a chef. I can do whatever I want. And they're like, no, that's cultural appropriation. No, it's not. Or there's that one guy who goes around, he dresses up in various, he'll dress up as like a Viking or he'll dress up in really a sombrero and he'll tape on like a really bad mustache and walk around going, hola, everyone. And he'll walk up to people going, am I offending you? And they will go, yes, yes, you are. You know, that's your outfit is very offensive. You're, you know, it's cultural appropriation. And then he'll go to Mexico, dress the same way. And go, am I offending you? And they go, no, I think it's actually really good that you're sharing our culture. You go, they go, you look kind of silly, but I'm not offended, you know. And so, it gives you a total sort of spin on where cultural appropriation and all that kind of stuff is coming from. It's usually coming from people who have nothing to do with the culture, who think that the other culture should be offended because you're offended, so they should be offended. And to me. That's offensive <laughs> where you're kind of go, you can't tell me that they're offended. Have you talked to them? Have you asked them if they're do you, offended? Do you have a movie that you think would not be culturally appropriate, but it's probably one of your favorite movies? Like Rush Hour is a good favorite of mine. Oh, you cannot play yeah. Those. Oh, my, one of my favorite movies is Blazing Saddles. Damn. Uh, 1974. If you, have you, if you've, have you ever seen Blazing Saddles? Yeah, it's not, I don't think it's that good though. Oh, well, see, again, see this the, for the humor in this was probably one of the funniest movies I've ever seen kind of thing in 1974. Um, then you could go and you, an OJ movie, Airplane. Uh, Airplane, sort of. Uh, That's weird. You said an OJ movie when that movie is like Snoop Dogg is usually what people talk about when they say Airplane. Yeah, but which is really funny. But he's OJ's in it, I think. Kind of thing. I think and, I'm thinking uh, of a different movie. Never mind. No, Airplane, the original Airplane, it came out before Naked Gun. Uh, That's right. They say Leslie Nielsen. Yeah. When it comes to yeah. uh, Airplane, not uh, well because Airplane. Was... That's the first time that that's where the classic line comes from. Shirley, you jest. I never jest, and don't call me Shirley. And that's where that line. Yeah. And. The or the the scene where he's a, there's a there's a <laughs> in the back where um, the slapping of the nun I think is the one where people are everyone's lined up to uh, take a punch at this nun kind of thing. Um, I think it's a is it a nun or the or the nuns oh, are also lined up to do it and all this all this stuff. So there's yeah so there's all these people are lined up to to punch this woman in the face because she is uh, riling up the passengers and getting them all. Overwork, so everybody, so everybody gets up and lines up in the, the aisle, and they're all going by punching this woman in the face, and she's like, "Ooh, oh, it's an old lady." That's what it is, <laughs> and they they're going by and they're punching, and so and you've got big black guys. Okay, hold on, hold on. You're why do you keep why do you keep explaining movie scenes? Could answer the question. The, the culture you, you said. So airplane. no, well, no, yes. Yeah, so culture that movie 
very culturally inappropriate. You know, lots of stuff going on. But hilarious if you really just kind of stare back and look at the comedy. That's that's the whole find. And that's uh, Ricky Gervais makes a good point about this where he talks about um, he goes, that's the irony of comedy. Like what you're he goes and what you're laughing at is not the actual thing that because the thing itself is possibly offensive. But what makes it funny is, is, you know, it's offensive. And that's why it's funny because you're showing it. So you're not actually laughing at the, you know, what you're seeing, you're laughing at the absurdity yeah. of what it is. And that's, that's the, that's humor. So you can't stop a comedian. It's the whole, like, and at, where you've got comedians who are being canceled, who are like, you, well, you can't say that. I think it's all over with now. I think everybody's just kind of producing. I see more political people being canceled than, yeah, than I do with comedians. Unless now. you, uh, unless you're a comedian who oh, who ups on the trans train, <laughs> like if you start yeah. talking about trans stuff, you're gonna get the, the somebody's gonna throw the cancel rod your way. But so. Leslie Nielsen was like, and if you ever seen him in superhero movie where he was talking about the the guy goes, "You're not my father," and he goes, "No, but I loved you like your father did. I made love to your mother like your father did." And he just like he started saying a bunch of stuff like that, and it's just hilarious because like. That's I wouldn't be appropriate to anything, but it's just you're laughing because this and somehow Leslie Nielsen. I mean, he slipped in at the perfect time. You know, I wish he was alive today, but yeah, I don't think he make a gun, able, naked make gun, naked gun, where he's standing on the bottom of the ladder and there's uh, Elvis's wife, well Priscilla Presley. He looks up, nice beaver. Thanks, I just had it stuffed. Yeah, and then she, she hands the down the stuffed it. beaver kind of thing. Now that again, that's just so crude but funny but also when the particularly when the beaver comes down and because every you know every he said a quote in the movie that gets clipped all the time where he's like just like a midget at a urinal i'll have to stand on my toes like come on like what are we talking about that pushed so many boundaries but it was hilarious and it's not that you're laughing at those people you're just laughing because it's just the stupidest absurd yeah yeah exactly what you're laughing at is the is the image and you're also laughing at the fact that he said it and you kind of go it um it's that's where the irony comes in where you're like you know it's offensive and that's why it's funny so should we have a reboot culture there is a culture of reboots they're making a new beverly hills cop but it begs the question can you still crack the same jokes and it come off not hurting anybody's feelings because i think oh, the yeah, main production yeah. of something you're not trying to hurt people's feelings you're just trying to go for a laugh and make people kind of chuckle or do one of the most significant amazing things in the world which is just make someone breathe hard out of their nose you know the like that that little that little you know, like it got you. You weren't trying to let out a laugh, but it got you. That's a very, I honestly believe myself that you can't really reboot something exactly how it was just with better graphics kind of thing, better film photography. A really good joke is culturally significant. Uh, and so there's, there's very few timeless jokes timeless humor uh you know some people like three stooges some people like the marx brothers some people don't some people like uh was it jack benny kind of thing with his uh the then there's some people who like andrew dice clay and some people who like you know eddie murphy when he, he was doing his stand-up and and some people can't stand that stuff they some people don't want to hear swears when they're you know i think you just get to a point where you have to create something and not care what people like or think about it too. It's why I don't read comments a whole lot. It's why I don't really, I just don't interact. Like I have a buddy who was on my show, Stuart recently, he was talking about, you got to put questions and stuff like that in your comments. So people can, you know, ask you questions and you can interact with your fans and you do giveaways. I was like, I don't have the fucking time in the day. And he was like, what? And I literally just saw him post on his Facebook about like eight different messages he got that are questions on Spotify about people just going, stop interviewing people. You're horrible about it. Go back to just doing the regular show that we came here in the first place with. And I go, this is the thing. You got to just do what you want and what you like to do. And people either accept you or they leave you. It's 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 whatever, because I'll have a bunch of people that will get interested in the JFK subject. 
And then I talk about ADHD one day, and then next thing you know, they're like, hey, go back to the ADHD or go back to the JFK stuff. Screw the ADHD stuff. Well, it's like, well, I'm not trying to impress you. I'm trying to do things for myself. And it's like you see that with if people actually enjoy you and like you, they'll follow you throughout whatever you do. And you see that with Elvis. He had fans drop off at different points. Every single celebrity has had moments where they'll say something and it might be politically charged. And then they'll go, you just lost the fan. And then it's like, why Why do you care? If you like them in the beginning, then their viewpoint doesn't have to always agree with you. It just, it might be something different. And you might just be like, it's cool. You know, like I liked Mike Tyson for his boxing. I didn't give a shit that he was a painter. <laughs> you actually, I think Elvis is a great um, tie into like your, the whole thing about, uh, because there, you could call it the different phases of Elvis because he had different phases that, um, when he moved into his next phase, he lost fans kind of thing, you know, the, but he got new fans and, you know, like older Elvis had this sort of, you know, kind of charisma and stuff, but the younger fans who were, uh, or he was very difficult to uh, attract, um, different types of fans when, when he moved into like sort of the new phase of what he was doing. Um, just the same as when you're doing like movies and reboots, you kind of just have to go, I'm just going to do what I want but um chances are you won't be able to use some of the the references or the jokes or the stuff that were in the movie because the the audience that's watching it now isn't going to get it and um there's a point where you go well if you're being true to the the word of the how if you're doing like an actual reboot or you do like what you suggested which is just take the idea and just kind of roll with it. And so as long as it's the, the basic idea, you're going to have to change it. Like even the end of the movies have to kind of be changed slightly because the, the way that we used to end movies doesn't really go with the new audience kind of thing. They want different endings. They want different tie-ins. They want different ways to kill the bad guy. Or in many ways, they don't want you to kill the bad guy. They just want the bad guy to be humiliated. And you're like, oh, okay, well, that's a different thing. And it's, and so that kind of changes the movie. But, you know, you look at when Beverly Hills Cop came out, the, you know, RoboCop and all that kind of stuff was going up. The, the bad guy, in fact, if I remember the end of Beverly Hills Cop, the original one, he, the bad guy dies, doesn't he, kind of thing? There's a, there's a shootout or there's some, I, if I remember... I think the bad guy dies in it. Oh, kind of don't thing, look at me remember. for the answer. I think it came out like the year before I was born. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I did see the when they were trying to reboot it, but they're also using Eddie. Eddie Murphy is in it. RoboCop? And, uh, no, uh, not RoboCop. Uh, Beverly Hills Cop. They're doing a Rube, another Beverly Hills Cop movie. Yeah, I just said that like five yeah. months ago. Yeah, but they but. They're not recasting. Eddie Murphy's going to be in it, kind of thing. So, yeah, I don't know if they, I don't know it's if they're going to do it. The, he was in the original ones too, but they just used a stunt double for um, some of his scenes that he did. Well, as they do, it's sort of like you know Harrison Ford doing. Um... Yeah, but they didn't do a good job covering with the stunt double. There's one where he goes through a plate glass window, and if you look at the camera as he's getting up from the thing, he's got like his a whole different hairstyle. It's like a comb over. I'm like, that's fucking, that's the stunt double. But to me, that's funny to watch those old movies it's, and see. I, well, very much like you, my, one of my favorite movies, I'm going to, I'll find the clip and I'll send it to you. Uh, I used to be a big uh, Diana Rigg fan um, who was basically known for like, you know, her latex you no know, cat suit she used to wear when the original Avengers. And when you talk about what we're talking about, you know, like the cancel culture and all that kind of stuff, you've got, um, they had an episode where they get captured by the, by Chinese nationals. So did they have a lot of Chinese people in the, the UK in the early sixties? No, no, they didn't. So all the actors are white guys with their eyes taped shut and Jesus you can see Christ. and you can see and you can see the tape uh over the eyes and it's just kind of white makeup over top and uh they did the same thing just on the slide shoot uh Dr. No the the first villain for James Bond he's got the tape on his eyes kind of thing and they now they explain it in the movie. He had an accident when he was a child, and that's why his eyes look the way they do, which is really interesting that they would do that. But in the Avengers, you've got all these Chinese nationals or nationals with all the taped eyes, 
And Diana Rigg, she's in prison and she breaks out of prison and she's about to get into a fight with one of the guards. All of a sudden, cut to, you're now looking at behind Diana Rigg and it's a guy, a really kind of big burly guy wearing a really bad wig who's now probably a, a good hundred pounds heavier is now fighting the guard. And it was <laughs> it's one of the funniest things because you got to go, are people not going to know that's not her? Like, why would they get it? What's the point of doing a stunt double for this thing? Because it's so obvious it's not her. But And the fight scene goes on for almost a minute, which is a long time on TV. And it's a long time to watch a big burly man in a black latex cat suit with a really bad wig. I find that hilarious. I'm glad movies do stuff like that. Like, it's like, hey, we're spending all the budget getting these actors in here. Let's just kind of take a break with it for a little bit. Well, that's right. Where this is back in the day. And again, here we're coming to the thing where people thought it was okay. People thought it was okay. Like, nobody, nobody batted an eye at, you know, all the, well, they couldn't because they were taken down, but um, everyone, Everybody went, no, it's okay. We can do this. So now when people watch that and we go, uh, they think you can't do that. That's so that's offense. And so I could see where some of the offense would be, but at the time they just did it because they was make, they were just saving money. There's makeup, but yeah, that's, those are the, those are the type of movies I really like watching where you go back in time and you go, you, you watch how, they were using the best of what they had with their money, but sometimes it just wasn't good. Like it was, you know, the special effects where you can almost, you can see the string holding the spaceship as it's going. <laughs> so those are the. Well, ending on one final question, but what would be your thoughts on express, I guess, expression and creative endeavors in the future? I mean, do you think it's going to just be taking about risks? I mean, life's all about risk, but it seems like this is one area where part of our culture, we don't want risks. I think uh, we're in a, there's a big upheaval happening right now. And though there's the, this threat of the, the woke culture and the cancel culture and uh, people being afraid to offend other people and uh, like polit political correctness used to be a good thing when people first talked about political correctness. Uh, and now it's almost a swear word. Now it's, um, you use it in a very uh, derogatory, well, that's not politically correct. Whereas before you would be, no, I'm just trying to be politically correct. This is, you know, I'm just trying to do the good thing. But I think there's this upheaval going where I think there's, there's going to be, creators are going to start creating again, probably within the next six months to a year where because uh there's a with the cancel culture and the woke culture and stuff it's almost like they're suppressing creativity and there's this pressure building up this is what i feel like in the end and i i just think that something's going to happen whether it's a some somebody does a movie like you said where they just go i don't give a shit i'm just going to put out this movie and it might be offensive to some people and when it first comes out it might be and then people are going to realize actually you know what this is a really cool thing what for whatever reason it is and it's going to people are going to go back to doing stories again they're going to go back to creating because right now people are afraid to even tell stories and i think the storytellers are getting pissed off and so i think the true creatives we need we need another quentin tarantino we need another stanley kubrick we need another you know who's we need people who are going to come out and just go you know what fuck it and just kick through that. And not, that's what I think is going to happen. I agree. Um, Casper, is there a place where people can find any of your links? Uh, just, uh, I'm the only Casper on uh, Facebook, Instagram kind of thing. So just Google me up social media and it'll take you right to me. All right. Well, I'm going to link all your links in the description. It's been a pleasure chatting with you. Thanks everybody for listening to this episode of the Blank Podcast. Stay tuned for our next episode.